Welcome, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Moreland. I teach in the law school at Villanova University and uh, was a visiting fellow here at the Center for Ethics and Culture a few years ago, and it's a great privilege to be moderating this afternoon's sessions on Evolving Legal Images of Personhood, the Emergence of the New Man in Western Law. Our speaker is Marianne Glendon who is well known to many of you. Marianne Glendon is the Learned Hand Professor of Law at Harvard University Emerita, a permanent senior distinguished research fellow of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture here at Notre Dame, and a former US ambassador to the Holy See. She currently serves on the US Commission on International Religious Freedom and as a member of the Board of Supervisors of the Institute of Religious Works. She writes and teaches in the fields of human rights, comparative law, constitutional law, and political theory. Professor Glendon has contributed widely to legal and social thought in numerous books and articles, inclu including The Forum and the Tower, Traditions and Turmoil, Rights Talk, and The Transformation of Family Law, winner of the Legal Academy's highest honor, the Order of the Coif Triennial Book Award. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, on which she served as president from 2003 to 2013, and the International Academy of Comparative Law. She is also a past president of the UNESCO-sponsored International Association of Legal Science. Professor Glendon served two terms as a member of the US President's Council on Bioethics from 2001 to 2004 and has represented the Holy See at various conferences, including the 1995 UN Women's Conference in Beijing, where she headed the Vatican delegation. Professor Glendon was elected to the American Academy in 1991, received the National Humanities Medal in 2006, and was the recipient of Notre Dame's own Evangelium Vitae Medal in 2018. Our respondent is the prime mover of all of this. Uh, <laughs> O. Carter Sneed, who is the Charles E. Rice Professor of Law at Notre Dame Law School as of uh, very recently, which is a great honor. <laughs> uh, concurrent Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame and the Director of Notre Dame's De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. He is one of the world's leading experts on public bioethics, the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. His research explores issues relating to neuroethics, enhancement, human embryo research, assisted reproduction, abortion, and end-of-life decision-making. He is most recently the author of What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, named one of the 10 best books of the year by the Wall Street Journal and winner of the 2021 Expanded Reason Award. Prior to joining the law faculty here at Notre Dame, Professor Sneed served as general counsel of the President's Council on Bioethics, and served as the US government's permanent observer to the Council of Europe's Steering Committee on Bioethics, where he assisted in its efforts to elaborate international instruments and standards for the ethical governance of science and medicine. In 2008, Professor Sneed was appointed by the Director General of UNESCO to a four-year term on the International Bioethics Committee, a 36-member body of independent experts that advises member states on bioethics law and public policy. In 2016, he was appointed to the Pontifical Academy for Life, the principal bioethics advisory body to Pope Francis. He is also an elected fellow of the Hastings Center, the oldest independent bioethics research institute in the world. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Marianne Glendon. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everybody. A funny thing happened while I was working on the paper for this conference. I started out with the idea of a historical comparison between images of personhood in continental European law and American law. And it was going along pretty well until I got to the 20th century. And then what was coming out of my word processor was so gloomy that I wondered whether Notre Dame requires trigger warnings uh, for, for the faint hearted. But then when I learned that Carter Sneed was going to be the respondent, I figured that uh, he can talk us all off the pre precipice. <laughs> I stopped worrying about it. 
Uh, my approach to this topic, a comparison of images of legal personhood, was inspired by something that the great anthropologist Geertz, Clifford Geertz, said in the Storrs lectures at Yale many years ago. He addressed some advice to comparatists like myself. He said, you legal comparatists would learn more and do better if you kept in mind that law, in addition to all the other things that it does, is part of a society's manner of imagining the real. He said, law, a country's law, like its art, its poetry, uh, it's music, songs. Law is, it both reflects and helps to shape the stories that we tell about who we are as a nation, where we came from, and what we aspire to be. And that was a really intriguing idea for me. And in fact, I did find uh, in my work that some of the most interesting comparisons among legal systems actually involve the symbols they deploy, the visions they project, and how those stories change over time. And often what starts out as straight power and interest ends up as myth and symbol. So I thought it might be fruitful from that perspective to look at concepts of personhood. And to do so by focusing on two moments, two historical moments of intense legal and social change where concepts of personhood were much involved. The first of those moments, not surprisingly, is the late 18th century, where not only were France and the United States, uh, in different ways, uh, installing completely new governments, but at the same time, enlightened monarchs like Frederick the Great in Prussia and Joseph II in Austria were quietly, more quietly, introducing major legal and administrative reforms. I'm not going to be speaking about Britain here because Britain's transition to constitutional monarchy was a century earlier and in many ways it's a special case. So I'm gonna be talking about continental Europe, the Romano-Germanic systems, and the United States. Now the late 18th century was also a time when statespersons were remarkably open to the ideas of philosophers. The French revolutionaries practically idolized Rousseau. Frederick of Prussia sought out the company and advice of Voltaire. And the authors of The Federalist drew upon a wide range, including ancient and modern sources and Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone, who were the three most frequently cited. The designs for government that emerged in that period were much influenced by philosophers' ideas about what human beings were like and what they thought of as the state of nature. For Locke, it was the dangerous propensities of human beings that made the state of nature so unsafe, insecure, that men were willing to give up some of their natural liberty and consent to government. Not just any government, but one that would protect their natural liberties. Locke did also speculate that men were also drawn into civil society by what he called a certain inclination for the company of others and by a sense of the good things that government and law might make possible. But what the authors of The Federalist seized upon was that part of Locke's thinking about the threat that men pose to one another. Montesquieu, on the other hand, was closer both to Genesis and to what we now know about early human beings. He said, man was formed to live in society, that we were social beings. Rousseau, on the other hand, thought that society was what ruined natural man. Rousseau captivated a whole generation with his image of what he believed to be our natural state. A simple creature, wholly wrapped up in the feeling of his own existence, mating casually without forming ties, unwilling to harm others unless his own self-preservation was at stake. Sound like anyone you know? For Rousseau, that was real felicity, and leaving it was a real loss. He thought, 
the reason men entered into society was not out of fear, but because the natural development of human faculties inevitably would lead them into forms of communal living and into governments and all the terrible things that that entails. There's been a lot of speculation about why those stories are so different, and I'm not going to speculate further, but I will say that I've always been attracted by a Swedish professor's idea that the tales were much influenced by what was coming back from the early explorers as they went around the world, and while the English were reading about the perils of the North American wilderness, the French were reading about the dolce far niente of the South Sea Islands. What we do know about those images, wherever they came from, is that they had a certain influence on how eight, late 18th century constitution makers and legal reformers thought about man and the state. In the United States, if there was one idea about personhood that was prominent in American political and legal thought at the time of the founding, it was the image of man as naturally born, free, equal, and independent, who enters government to preserve his God-given rights. In the familiar words of the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is to secure those rights that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Govern. That image was, of course, not the whole story, but it was a compelling story, and it had more than a little resonance with the culture of the times and the new nation. It sat well with the Protestant reformers' belief that the individual is the judge of religious truth, and with the spirit of men and women who had built a new nation and then took the momentous step of separating themselves from one of the world's great powers. In the Federalist, however, the image of the human person is a good deal more complicated. And it's in the Federalist where the framers' ideas about government are explicitly grounded in ideas about what human beings are like. As Madison famously put it, what is government but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? It is remarkable how often in the Federalist they refer to human nature. There are over 100 references in the Federalist papers to the nature of man. And the authors begin by taking, by following Locke very closely in his theory that it was the dangerous aspects of human nature that made life so precarious that men were led by reason into government. But the point that the Federalist wanted to drive home was that those dangerous propensities don't go away once men enter government. And so what they're leading up to from mistrust of human nature is mistrust of government and hence to the necessity for checks and balances. So here are the kinds of things they say about human nature. Men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious. If impulse and opportunity be suffered to coincide, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequate control. Men are much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. And they don't let women off either. They have a lot of bad things to say about women. So Madison says government being composed of human beings has the faults of human beings. And I'll quote from him here. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary, checks and balances, to control the abuses of government. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, no external or internal controls on government would be necessary. But in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, you must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place to control itself. Still, there's something puzzling about that view of human nature in the Federalist. On the one hand, they say you can't count on human reason when the chips are down, but on the other hand, they are addressing all their arguments to what they describe as correct and unprejudiced minds. They are clearly 
resting all their hopes on people who can master the passions and who can act rationally and even against their own self-interest for the public interest at times. They're looking for people who can, in the stirring words of Federalist One, show the world whether societies of men are really capable of establishing good government by reflection and choice, rather than depending always for their political constitutions on accident and force. And there's even another striking anomaly in the Federalist. After emphasizing how bad human beings are, they tell their readers that the new design for government will require a higher degree of civic virtue than any other form that has ever been devised. But if human beings are so terrible, where did they think they were going to find the citizens and statespersons with the right stuff? Madison hints at an answer in Federalist 55, where he says he has confidence in the present genius of the American people. But then he goes on to make a very unsettling remark. He says, what change of circumstances or time or a fuller population of our country may produce requires a prophetic spirit to declare, which makes no part of my pretensions. That was when the population of the United States was four million people. I'll come back to that passage later, but now I must say a few words about the concepts of personhood that were influential in continental countries as they embarked on their transitions from relatively absolute monarchies to modern states. And I'll take as my examples Prussia, which uh, was about the third of a size of what is modern Germany, and France. Now you might expect there would be very little resemblance between modernizing reforms instituted by Frederick the Great in 1794 and the changes made by the French revolutionaries in the bloody year of 1793. But there are striking similarities. Both of the documents proclaimed in those two years started out with the proposition that men are born free and equal with certain natural rights. Unlike the US Declaration of Independence and our Bill of Rights, the Europeans spelled out in those two documents something that our founders did not seem ne deem necessary to mention. I believe they just took it for granted, namely that citizens have obligations, rights have limits, and everyone must respect the rights of others. The image in the continental documents was of persons who are born free and equal, but as Montesquieu put it, born for society, and thus situated in relationships that entail certain obligations. It was a vision of liberty, equality, and fraternity rather than life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that relational image remains dominant in European constitutions today. For example, the German Constitutional Court frequently repeats this kind of statement. The image of man in the German basic law is not that of an isolated sovereign individual and freedom in the basic law is not that of an isolated and self-regarding individual, but rather of a person related to and bound by the community. That explicit emphasis on the relational aspect of human personhood is one of the major features that differentiates the continental systems from the American. But the contrast diminishes somewhat when we remember that the US Constitution was a constitution for a federal form of government and that it left room for the states to introduce the communal elements that had been promoted by the anti-federalists, among them established churches. But the contrast diminishes further now that state laws have changed so much and centralized government has become ever more centralized in the United States. Now here's another really interesting difference between the two families of charters in the late 18th century. Both the French Constitution of 1793 and the Prussian Code of 1794 recognized a duty on the part of the state to care for indigents. According to the Prussian Code, it was, quote, incumbent on the state to oversee the nourishment, employment, and salary of all those who cannot maintain themselves. 
That might sound to some people like early socialism, but Tocqueville makes a very important point about that in his history of the old regime and the French Revolution. Tocqueville saw the state's duty to provide for the indigent as rooted in the old feudal pyramid of protection and dependence, with protection running down from the king to his vassals and their subjects, and loyalty running back up through the pyramid to the king. Now Frederick, thinking himself a very modern monarch, in his Prussian general code, he substituted the word state for the word king. But he was still the king, and he was the state. So this was, in a way, how the stage was set for Germany 100 years later to introduce the world's first social security system. A similar process took place in several other European countries as they made their transitions to constitutional monarchy. And the perceptive Tocqueville saw essentially the same process at work in France, even though the monarchy there was ended by violent revolution rather than gradual reform. After the French Revolution, the state uh, gradually eliminated, didn't gradually, it suddenly eliminated the power of the communes, the local governments, and of course took over the functions of educational and charitable services previously provided by religious institutions. Today, both the French Constitution and the German Basic Law and many other European constitutions incorporate that same vision of governmental responsibility for the basic needs of citizens with a single phrase. At the beginning, they identify their polities as social states. So in the basic law, the German Republic is a federal democratic and social state. And that word social has enormous um, implications in constitutional decisions about uh, certain regulations that in the United States would certainly be held unconstitutional. So America, as you know, in America, by contrast, one of the great controversies at the time of the founding was prompted by hostility toward and fear of excessive centralization. And even when the United States established a national social security system in the 1930s, President Roosevelt took pains to repudiate the idea that the central state should be the ultimate guarantor of citizens' well-being. In his 1935 State of the Union address, he explained that the national government was obliged to act in this emergency, but that public assistance would remain primarily in the hands of local institutions and private providers. Since then, of course, the New Deal has become a new deck, and increasing centralization has brought the US system closer to European models. So, summing up to here, we're just at the end of the 18th century, but never fear, uh, the next part is going to be shorter. Summing up to here, somewhat different images of the person, of freedom, and the relationship between man and state emerged in the early American and continental systems, even though both claimed grounding in natural right, natural liberty, and equality. The American emphasis on the free and equal individual corresponded well with many elements in the culture. Um, ideas, biblical ideas of human beings as uniquely valuable, American ideals of self-reliance and independent thought, and the Federalist realism about nature coupled with their cautious confidence in human reason, served well the cause of limited government. On the continent, the relational aspects of the personhood corresponded well with Christian ideas of love of neighbor, with cultural traditions that emphasized fraternity, or as we now would say, solidarity, and together with remnants of feudalism that went a long way toward legitimating the modern European social states. I'm going to suggest that each of these images, in its way, represented an effort to hold together the two halves of the divided soul of the democratic experiments, the love of freedom and the sense of a community to which everyone bears a certain responsibility. One of the first legal scholars to remark on the relatively greater uh, emphasis on individualism in American law 
was a legal comparatist, Roscoe Pound, who wrote in the 1930s that while all modern legal systems could be said to be individualistic in comparison to pre-modern systems, American law was distinguished by the fact that the idea of, quote, an isolated individual was at the center of many of our most significant legal doctrines. Still widely quoted, quoted today in American legal circles is Justice Brandeis' dictum that the right most valued among civilized men, the most comprehensive of rights, is the right to be let alone. Another telling example of uh, Pound's point is a long-standing principle in American tort law. Any law students here? There must be some law students here. So um, tort law, Teachers very often in the first year shock their students by asking them to imagine the hypothetical of an Olympic swimmer walking along and seeing a helpless child drowning and walking right on by. I think my torts professor back then said, and lit up a cigarette and walked on by. But <laughs> today, just and, um, and uh, then he tells them that uh, the Olympic swimmer in, under American law, except in five or six states, has no duty to do anything. Um, that doctrine is the, wor the, the reverse in the continental systems where they're both criminal and civil penalties for a failure to rescue. And the way that duty is described in the leading French torts treatise is interesting. There aren't very many actual cases, but the treatise writer says, the chief importance of these laws is, quote, to serve as a reminder that we are members of society and ought to act responsibly. So here we have a pretty clear contrast between different ideas about law. In the continental systems, law has an overt pedagogical function within a state visualized as responsible for the citizen's well-being, while in the United States, at least as traditionally conceived, law exists, prim government exists prim primarily to protect the lives and liberties of the citizens, leaving many matters, such as the duty to rescue, to be governed by social rather than legal norms. Free by the laws and restrained by the manners, as Montesquieu once said about the English. Now, while noting those differences, I want to be careful not to exaggerate them. Over time, the continental and American visions often converged, and where one vision predominates, elements of the other are invariably present as undercurrents or countercurrents, and often the differences are mainly matters of emphasis. But social science data does indicate that they reflect some significant cultural differences. For example, Americans are still at one end of the world spectrum, in the proportion of people who say they value freedom over equality, that success in life is determined by individual efforts, and that freedom from state interference is more important than state guarantees of minimum subsistence. So now I come to the second of the two moments that of, cha of intense change that I mentioned at the beginning of the speech. I'm referring to the massive changes in behavior, ideas, and law that took place in Western countries in the late 20th century. Those changes were so profound that I think they can fairly be described as a cultural revolution. And in the wake of those changes, there was a certain convergence in legal images of the personhood. So in my title where I referred to the new man, uh, this is, uh, the outline of the new image that seems to be appearing in both systems. Starting in the 1960s, there was a demographic upheaval in the United States and Western Europe. The head of the French National Demographic Institute summed up the data for the most intense 15 years of change this way. He said, in barely 15 years in the industrialized countries, the birth rate and the marriage rate tumbled while divorces and births outside marriage increased rapidly, and here's the important part, with increases or decreases of more than 50%. That profound alteration in behavior and attitudes had a marked influence on the law. Both in Europe and the United States, the law became a testing ground for various ways of reimagining family relations, equality between men and women, and human sexuality. In the end, the new laws, not, 
not only reflected cultural trends that were already underway, but to some extent helped to shape them and probably to accelerate them. By the 1990s, the demographic indicators had stabilized, but they stabilized around their new high or new low levels. And a new image of personhood was rivaling the older images, both in American and European law. The new image was implicit in many decisions of the European Court of Human Rights under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but the most explicit version of the new image was in the US Supreme Court's decision in Casey versus Planned Parenthood, where in 1992, a plurality of the court linked personhood with a novel definition of freedom. The freedom to, quote, define one's own concept of existence, of the meaning of the universe, and the mystery of human life. That freedom, they said, lies at the heart of liberty because beliefs in those matters could not define the attributes of personhood were they formed under compulsion of the state. That hyper-individualistic concept of freedom is in tension both with the commitment to active citizenship that the Federalists saw as essential for the American experiment and with the sense of solidarity that historically characterized the continental systems. The idea of personhood is something to be defined and redefined by unfettered individual choice did reflect attitudes that were prevalent in elite culture, in the media, the world of entertainment, but it is quite distant from the lives that people embedded in relationships, and that means most of us, and, for, and that does mean most of us because most of us are dependent for much of our lives, caring for dependents for much of our lives, or financially responsible for dependents. Thus, the more fully a legal system or a society embraces the notion of radical individual autonomy, the more risk it creates for the weak, the vulnerable, and those who care for them, as evidenced by relaxation of legal restrictions on abortion and euthanasia. And as acceptance grows in society of an unrealistic image of the self, there is often what Taylor describes, Charles Taylor in his Sources of the Self, describes as, quote, a lack of fit between what people officially and consciously believe, even pride themselves on believing, on the one hand, and what they need in order to make sense of some of their moral reactions, on the other. And difficult questions also arise concerning the political implications of new images of freedom and personhood. What do they mean for the maintenance of democratic experiments that, as the authors of The Federalist told us, require a higher degree of civic virtue in citizens and statespersons than any other form of government? It's unsettling in that connection to recall Tocqueville's dark vision in volume two of Democracy in America. By the time that Tocqueville wrote that second volume, 10 years later. Tocqueville had begun, begun to fear that some of the appearance of freedom could be maintained in democracies, while the substance of real political liberty gradually slipped away. What could be more convenient for enemies of democracy, he wrote, than a people, quote, so engrossed in a cowardly love of immediate pleasures that they will prefer tamely to submit to a strong central power that will attempt to regulate everyone and everything. Here he was echoing his distant master Montesquieu who had said long before that there's nothing a despotic regime likes better than a population of individuals absorbed in their own affairs. Now, here is where I probably should say that what's coming is not for the faint-hearted. That was, that was the not gloomy stuff. In an effort to imagine what new modern forms of tyranny might look like, Tocqueville wrote this. I see an innumerable multitude of men, alike and equal, constantly circling around in pursuit of the petty and banal pleasures with which they glut their souls. Each one of them withdrawn into himself is almost unaware of the fate of the rest. Over this kind of men, 
stands an immense protective power which is alone responsible for securing their enjoyment and watching over their fate. Every so often, Tocqueville goes on to say, the subjects do arise just long enough to exercise the vote for their masters. But in the end, such a government will strip them all of several of the chief attributes of humanity. They will still be equal, but equal in servitude, not in freedom, subjects, but not citizens. Okay, nobody fainted. It would be good to believe with the authors of The Federalists that despite the flaws in human nature, Americans have enough reason to enable us to reflect on where we are as a nation, to make judgments about where we're headed, and to correct course if necessary. But today we find ourselves face to face with Madison's unsettling speculation in Federalist 55. Is there still enough? character and competence among American citizens and statespersons to sustain a democratic experiment. To what degree are Americans still attached to the ideals of self-reliance and sturdy independence of mind directed toward the common good? And as for continental Europe, to what extent are Europeans still attached to social solidarity directed toward the common good? To what extent have the civic ideals elevated at the birth of their democratic experiments given way to idolization of personal choice? And what has become of the great Western synthesis of Greek philosophy, Roman law and administration, biblical religion, and enlightenment rationality, which constitutes the foundation of both the American and continental democratic experiments? The answers to those fateful questions lie hidden in the future, but as to how one might think about such answers, I can do no better than to end with what Pope St. John Paul II had to say about personhood and political freedom. Different philosophical systems have lured people into believing that they are their own absolute master able to decide their own destiny and future in complete autonomy, trusting only in themselves and their own powers. But when freedom is detached from the truth about the human person, it deteriorates into license in the lives of individuals, and in political life it becomes the caprice of the most powerful and the arrogance of power. Far from being a limitation on freedom or a threat to it, reference to the truth about the human person a truth universally knowable through the moral law written on the hearts of all is, in fact, the guarantor of freedom's future. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you so much, Marianne. It's, uh, when, when Marianne agreed to speak at this conference, I, I abused my director's privilege and I inserted myself into the conversation <laughs> as a respondent to my very dear friend, uh, Marianne. Um, I'd like to amplify a few things that, uh, that Marianne said in, in her remarks and then enlarge a little bit in a context that is close to both of our hearts and something that we've worked on together, in fact, and that is in the context of public bioethics, the, uh, an anthropological error that has dire consequences for public bioethics, namely the, the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. But before I do that, I'd like to say briefly, I think it's really important for us all to internalize what um, Marianne began with, which is to say the proposition that law is irreducibly normative. There is no way to think about law, to talk about law, to make law, to, to critique law without understanding that it is at its core a normative enterprise, meaning law, all law aims at a particular good to be pursued or a particular harm to be avoided no matter what the magnitude or context is. And therefore, one of the essential pathways into understanding the law is to understand what its normative purposes are. Uh, and by extension, law trades in concepts, norm, thick normative concepts like justice and equality and freedom and the like. And so there is no law, there's no conversation with law, about law, there's no law itself without, without 
a normative discussion, right? You can't separate law and morality. You can't separate laws, law and principles of justice, um, uh, which isn't the same thing as saying that every, every unjust thing has to be uh, an object of legal interference or regulation. It's just to say everything that is in the arms of the law is something that is normatively laden. And as a result, as Marianne said, law has this important pedagogical function. It is important to pay very careful attention to what the law does and doesn't do for a given society. It, it reflects the goods that a polity holds dearly, uh, but it also shapes, for better or worse, shapes people's understandings of what they should hold dearly and what, how they should think about justice and freedom and equality and such like. So I think those are important points that, that, that are something that we talk about here a lot at, at Notre Dame and Notre Dame Law School, but they are in the, in, the more, in the broader public square. People frequently insist upon some kind of absolute separation between law and values, law and morality, law and justice, and those, that's, I think, an unsustainable and, and really an impossible uh, proposal. But even more deeply still, and this goes to the heart of Marianne's remarks, all law exists to protect and promote the flourishing of persons. That's what law is in the most basic sense. And accordingly, all law has to operate according to an ex ante or prior understanding of what persons are and what, and, and what, what constitutes human flourishing and human identity and human nature. We learned, Marianne talked a lot about the Federalist Papers' reflection on what human nature was and the continental tradition, thinking about what human nature is in shaping the, the legal landscape accordingly. And that being what, it, and, and that, and that's true despite the fact that the concept of human identity, and human nature, and personhood, and the like, are vigorously and fiercely contested. Right? People disagree strongly about what constitutes human identity and human flourishing, and that that's true. But that's a problem that we have to grapple with because there's no getting around that question. There's no getting around that question in, to build, uh, to live by, or to respond to, the law. And I would say, by extension the most important and deepest understanding of law itself is what Professor Glendon did in her remarks, which is what one could call an anthropological analysis of legal principles. You look at the law, you look at the doctrinal principles, the policies, the discourse, the principles of justice and other sort of political theoretical principles, and you drill down to the very most basic level and ask, who does the law think I am as a person? What does the law think I am? What does the law think my flourishing consists in? What, what is necessary for me to thrive? And, uh, and what are the perils that I need to be protected from or I need to be enabled to protect myself from? So anthropological analysis of the law is, as in my judgment, the, a deep and essential mode and point of entry into the law itself. And the bulk of Marianne's extraordinary and interesting remarks were to show how these presuppositions about human identity, human flourishing, uh, in some ways, can, while, while they can advance the goods the law means to, it can also lead to very serious problems. When the law makes mistakes about what and who people are and what the boundaries of the moral and legal community are, things go very badly wrong uh, very quickly. And in the context, in the, in the area that I work in and that Marianne and I have worked together in, and Michael actually works in as well, the context of public bioethics, American public bioethics, public bioethics in the, in the intergovernmental space, uh, what one sees in certain essential vital conflicts um, is where the law makes fundamental mistakes about what and who human beings are. Not the question, by the way, of when life begins or when it ends or should end, although those are deeply connected questions. I'm talking about the community of persons that everyone agrees upon, what is our identity and what is our, what is our flourishing. And if you look carefully, if you drill down in an inductive way and make an anthropological analysis of essential areas of the law of public bioethics, what you find is uh, a vision of the person um, that very closely tracks what sociologist Robert Bella uh, described as expressive individualism. Charles Taylor, Alistair McIntyre, Michael Sandel, others have, 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 have weighed in on this question as well and have identified a sort of cluster of characteristics that are associated with the, the, the person within this framework. And it's interesting though because in your remarks you talked about the continental tradition in Rousseau. Rousseau, according to the very, I think, persuasive genealogy of Charles Taylor, is one of the principal culprits 
for expressive individualism in terms of thinking about the inner voice as being definitive and morally, uh, more, uh, the, the moral guide that is really the, the definitive and, and authoritative guide as opposed to the external world around one. But expressive individualism in a nutshell is it conceives of the person as an atomized individual, right? The, the basic unit of reality is the individual person, the, 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 person, the, the person in nature bestriding his environment. Um, uh, alone, shorn of all, shorn of all constitutive attachments, um, defined by his or her capacity to do the work of the mind and the will, to to consult and interrogate the interior sense to find authentic, original, maybe transgressive meaning, project, express that, and then configure your life plan accordingly, based on what you discover inside yourself. And relationships come into play with other people insofar as as they are instruments to pursuing the objects of the will. So wills, atomized individual wills can come together in collaboration when they share common goals, but when they don't, they don't need to be together at all and they break apart. And frequently, atomized individual wills encounter each other as adversaries and they have to overbear one another rather than working in a collaborative, in a collaborative fashion. This vision of the person is sort of aggressively anti-teleological, meaning it doesn't take the natural givens of the physical world as instructive as a guide to thinking about what we should do or how we should act or should be. It, it's dualistic, it prioritizes cognition as the seat of personal identity rather than sort of the psychosomatic unity of body and mind. Um, and, um, and again, as I said, regards relationships primarily as transactional and does not recognize the category of obligations that are unchosen obligations. Obligations emerge from agreements uh, and, and transactions usually for mutual benefit. And so, um, so this is the this is the vision, and, and the interest, and, and it's it is there are true things about this. Of course, human beings are particular. We're free. We have free will, and it's important to be creative and authentic and original. And sometimes it's important to be transgressive, but um, but that's not the whole truth of who we are. As Marianne said, the arc of the human life begins in utter dependence, and in the very best circumstances, it follows a very gentle trajectory up to the height of your powers and then immediately pivots back downwards towards a state of total dependence again. So the world of expressive individualism, or the, the vision of expressive individualism describes the very most privileged people at the very most advantageous moment in their lifespan. It's a tiny little snapshot. And to build a system of laws around that is to miss fundamentally the truth of the matter, which is human beings are not simply our minds, our wills, and our flourishing is not simply the assertion of the unencumbered will and the unencumbered self. Um, and I argue that the reason that one of the fundamental errors of this anthropological set of premises is that it fails to take seriously the fact that we are, all of us, every human being that has ever existed on planet Earth, is an embodied being. A, a living, is a living body. Not has a living body, but is a living body. Um, and as a result of being a living body, an integrated psychosomatic unity, that, that means that we um, stand in a particular kind of relationship to one another. We are all subject to natural limits. We are all fragile and finite, and we get sick, and we get hurt, and we die. And that stands us in a particular kind of relationship, a relationship of reciprocal indebtedness to one another, of reciprocal obligation. And what we need for flourishing is not the freedom of the unencumbered will alone. It is what McIntyre has called networks of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving composed of people who are willing to make the good of the other his or her own good. And that's essential, A, for our survival, because none of us would be here unless someone did that when we were, even before we were born. And B, it teaches us to become the thing that I argue normally we are meant to be. We are made as embodied beings for love and friendship. That's what human flourishing is. We're at our most human when we are taking care of one another, and to shore up and sustain these networks of uncalculated good, uh, uncalculated um, giving and graceful receiving are required what McIntyre and others have called uh, the virtues of acknowledged dependence, the virtues of uncalculated giving, just generosity, giving in proportion to need, not seeking to count the cost. Hospitality, welcoming the stranger because he or she is a stranger. Misericordia, taking on the suffering of the other as if it were your own suffering as well as the goods uh, or the, uh, the virtues of, of graceful receiving, chief among them gratitude. The, real, the realization that we are here and we survive because of the, of the, of the, the goodwill of others.
and because of the support of others. And everything, accordingly, is, at the end of the day, a gift. And that should engender a sense of humility and openness to the unbidden and tolerance of imperfection and a sense of solidarity and a sense of the respect for the intrinsic equal dignity of every human being and a commitment to honesty. In other words, all the goods, virtues, and practices of authentic friendship. That is what human beings need to flourish and survive, and we can understand that by meditating and reflecting on the fact that we are, in fact, in our essence, embodied beings. And to see the world through the lens of expressive individualism is to miss the elderly and children and the disabled and the poor and racial minorities who are discriminated against. To miss, uh, to miss entirely a huge multitude of our brothers and sisters in the human family. Um, and so it seems to me that, that, that if we want to have a, a bright side <laughs> to, to the talk that you were describing or the, to, to the message that you sort of left us with, it is the fact that I think we can, in fact, convey this truth about human identity and human flourishing to our friends and neighbors through the practice of radical self-emptying love for them. It is by loving our neighbor that we can help other people to understand who we are and what we're made for. And, um, and so, in some ways, the good news is it's up to us. It's up to us not to criticize the way the government is just, you know, configured to, uh, that favors one group over the other or that we have a shortage of virtue uh, in our public figures and we are at each other's throats in a polarized and toxic fashion all the time, it feels like. Um, the way we can fix it is by loving each other better. And that's my responsibility. That's, I don't have to worry about any other people. My job is to love other people better and, and, and to start with the person that's right in front of me. So that is my effort to, <laughs> to bring something happy and positive into the conversation. And let's open the floor to, to questions and discussion. Thank, thank you both to uh, Professor Glendon and Professor Sneed for those immensely thoughtful remarks. Uh, so we have some time for questions and answers. Uh, as a standard practice, there will be some microphones here, uh, one on that side of the room, one on that side. And if you could uh, queue up uh, and say uh, briefly who you are and, um, and then get to, a, get to a question. So we'll start right here. Hi, my name is Sean Dudley, and I am a double domer, uh, undergrad in law. Um, what is synodality? I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm looking for further words of encouragement along those lines, Professor Schneed, um, where we have a lot of celebrity politicians who are more interested in treating us as individual persons as more clickbait, you know, targets. Uh, I would say it's almost to the point that we're not expressive individuals, but maybe consumptive individuals in their minds, where we're just the consumers. To your point, Professor Glendon, um, all of us that are just seeking our own desires while the powers that be are doing whatever they're gonna do. So I'm looking for some more words of encouragement about what you're seeing or what it would take on a more institutional level to exhibit and instruct in the civic virtues and to start take over some of the mudslinging that's going on with virtuous people that are in office instead of just all these celebrities. You can jump into it, right? <laughs> Go ahead. You want me to yeah, start? Yeah, you start. Talk about it. Yeah. Wow. Well, of course, uh, that's that's the question. If, you know, the person who can answer that should get five Nobel prizes. Uh, but uh, it's the right question to ask. I mean, what do we do? Uh, if it didn't come through in my talk, I am very worried about the state of American culture. And I think we should be worried. And so, uh, where to start? For one thing, American education from kindergarten on up through the nation's colleges and universities is in terrible shape. And so uh, it's a, a place where that needs to be, where our cultural problem needs to be addressed is right in the seed beds of those civic virtues that 
Madison Hamilton and Jay said would be essential for our form of govern and government, and those seed beds are the nation's families and schools. So, uh, now I, I'm not gonna say anything very ho hopeful here because just as the educational system is not in the best of shape, the nation's families are not in the best of shape. And so I think Carter is absolutely right. You begin, and by the way, Benedict, John Paul II said the same thing, that transformation really begins in here. But uh, it, Benedict once answered a question like yours from, a, from a, a young man, and Benedict said, just think of yourself as a, of an island and a great sea and you work on transforming yourself and pretty soon you will have an effect on others and they will engage in transformation. And I guess, you know, if I would add uh, to what I said in my talks, I think this elevation of, people don't take this elevation of unfettered personal choice seriously enough because our choices are what constitute us as what we are. Every day in every way, as the song goes, every breath you take, every move you make, you are <laughs> constituting yourself as a certain kind of person, either a better person or a worse person. So we know where the starting point is, we know where the seed beds are, but I, I, how can a whole culture transform itself? I mean, as Christians, we have to believe it's possible but it's a very serious question. So I'm just gonna give two sentences in response. One is, well, this is, doesn't count. Sean was our student. I remember Sean, it's great to see you, Sean. Um, the, uh, as lawyers, and you're a lawyer, uh, people think about public policy. We try to think about things at scale. I think that's a problem. I don't think we can think about transforming culture at scale immediately. You have to start smaller and you have to think about, and this is in some ways what you were talking about with the Federalist Papers, they were counting on the virtues of the American people in the townships themselves. They knew what they were working with because they were good, uh, you know, as far as it goes, folks. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if they were good folks, but, I, but <laughs> that was the pre presupposition. In any event, think about, yeah, we have to think about smaller scale, and this is just to amplify what she had said, to think about grand solutions. How can I, how can we transform congressional and presidential candidates into more virtuous? That's like, don't start there. That's too much. It, it bubbles up from the bottom if it, if it happens at all. Over to the other side of the room. Thank you. Yes, and relevant to your last response, I'm a uh, retired high school teacher. Uh, my name is Jim McGarry. Uh, Professor Glennon, could you, could you please apply the laws regarding the right to claim asylum uh, to your framework of uh, American and European law, particularly in the context of the experience of immigrants in World War II, and um, also in terms of what was said about uh, the unchosen obligations that we face. Thank you. Well, um, I, I really, don't have a whole lot to say in response uh, in, in relation to my thesis about human personhood. The, uh, the founding concepts in both the continental systems and the United States are so capacious that they include everyone, not just citizens of a particular republic. For example, is the French Declaration is the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And rights of man, so the concepts, the founding concepts are capacious enough to concede personhood, full humanity to everyone. But we all know sadly that in none of the democratic experiments did the societies or the laws live up fully to the propositions to which they were committed. On the other hand, we have seen in these democratic experiments that the mere existence of the propositions, as Martin Luther King said, they were like promissory notes. And they were there, they were something to live up to. Thank you so much. Pilar Vasquez from Mexico City, but have been living in DC for 10 years now. Um, an honor to hear both of you. 
On the understanding of the human beings, we depend on one another mostly. We might be, you know, adults, but at some point we will get sick and depend on someone else, right, while we're sick. Uh, but we also want to preserve the individual and also the part of being social. How do we get to that balance in law? Just real quick, one of the things I saw at UNESCO when we were negotiating the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights from 2003 to 2005 was that different cultures have placed, and this is obviously a large part of Mary Ann's talk, have placed different emphases on the individual versus the collective. And there are instances of excess on the collective side of the equation. It's not, it's not in the same way that we might argue in American law we have some excesses on the individualism side of the equation. Obviously, they are, both are true and important to human identity. But I'll, I'll just, I, I mean, the, the, the UNESCO process begins with questionnaires. They sent around questionnaires to all the member states. It's a very small rate of response. It's only something like 15% of the member states responded to the questionnaire. But the questionnaire was asking about concepts and principles that would be, uh, should be Im included and incorporated into any universal declaration on bioethics and human rights. And this was a very significant fault line among the delegations from some, from some countries where collectivism was a, was a primary focus and those which had more individualistic traditions. And so, um, you know, that you, can, you can have excess on both sides and I don't, I don't have a solution to the question of how do you bring them into balance, but, um, you know, in that process, that deliberative process, we, we had discussion amongst the member states about how to balance those things and attempt to, to sort of in a, you know, from different traditions speak to one another about what's valuable and what's not. But there's no, there's no, I don't have an answer as to how to calibrate those two things. But I can tell you I've seen excessive emphasis in different cultural settings. Yeah, I, I think actually the problem is not holding them together. I, I, think, I don't think it's uh, there's any contradiction between having a sense of the new, unique value of each and every human being and having a sense that we are social beings and each of us uniquely individual is a part of our makeup is that Locke used the word, we have that inclination uh, for society. Montesquieu was the one who was right about that. Uh, it's more than an inclination. And what we know about early human beings is that, so uh, I think the problem is to hold them together without letting one overwhelm the other. And that's life. Uh, this is actually very closely related to that. Professor Glennon, you've talked uh, before at, at this forum about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And, uh, and the paradox that they all agreed on the human rights, but don't ask them why. Uh, and Jacques Maritain said, you know, that's where the, you know, the, the problem begins. Uh, I'm wondering if that's kind of a key moment when it was possible to see the beginning of that fissure between uh, the cultures of different nation states, uh, you know, whether, whether social solidarity or the, the freedom of the individual. Uh, which is a little bit earlier than I would have expected the fissure to be. It certainly went, uh, you know, enormous from there. But uh, is that a moment when, uh, you know, it might have been possible to start saying, gee, we, need, we really need to work on this. And the Catholics were, and the Catholic Church was, uh, among others. But uh, I wonder if that's, that was part of the problem there. They couldn't define dignity and they couldn't define where the rights came from. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, that, as usual, you go right to the heart of things. Um, it was, the way I think about that moment, it was a, an amazing opportunity. And the thing that you're, you're gonna hear a little bit more gloom here because uh, did it really take two world wars and the horrors of the second one in particular, they were both horrible, unprecedentedly so. Did it really take two world wars to bring the nations together, even notionally, to agree on a set of universal rights? And now, as Richard says, uh, almost as soon as that happened, you have the Cold War and this split between uh, 
powerful country that is promulgating the social and economic principles, at least in lip service, but not the liberty principles and another great power promulgating the liberty principles and weaponizing them. And uh, I have to say, I mean, here we are 75 years later when we really need some kind of appeal. If you don't have an appeal to some principle, then, as Thucydides taught us a long time ago, it's only, right is only a question between equals and power. The strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And I think I mean, we should all be very worried about the world situation from that point of view. Is it going to take something on the scale of what happened in the 1940s and the early part of the 20th century to get us to be sensible about recognizing a few principles? Right here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nathan Myers, and I am from Benedictine College. So my question was actually, um, so you, basically, you were talking about how the law exists, the law is based on what our definition of personhood is, and how our, like, what does the law think I am, and whatnot, so our law comes from what we think of personhood. So um, this is just, well, on the 20th century, but also just on law in general, just a made, made, a, made a question on law in general is, does our understanding of personhood personhood define law, or does the law define our understanding of personhood? Like a chicken or egg, sort of like, what is like, is it the law that sort of like influences how we, what we think of personhood, or does like our prior cult cultural understanding of personhood def create our, like our law and personhood? Oh. <laughs> I'll just say um, that uh, I think in, uh, Probably most of the world, if you ask people, does law define the way I think about human persons? Uh, people would say that's a ridiculous question. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> uh, I don't take my bearings from the law. Um, but I, uh, one, of, one of the things that I have noticed and, and think about as a comparatist is that um, in a country that is very large and very diverse, the country that Madison was imagining, here we are, we have four million, what if we had many, what if we had 400 million? A country that is very large and very diverse and doesn't have a sense of all the things that might hold a smaller country together, the songs and the stories and the shared history, then I think law has somewhat more influence on the way Americans think about the moral aspects of questions like abortion and euthanasia. So, uh, whereas in some places where there were other stronger cultural elements, people would say, oh, the law is just wrong. Uh, I think for many people, and I did live through that period after Roe versus Wade, I think for many people, the fact that these judges in black robes who then enjoyed great confidence in our society all thought that abortion could be permitted uh, and later that there could even be a right, uh, I think that marginally had some influence on the way people thought about abortion and later about euthanasia. Did you want to? No, that's fine. Let's move on to it. Um, ben Hulba at Arizona State University, thanks for the really wonderful panel. My question actually really is just a sort of footnote on the previous question, um, which is to say not, you know, um, which comes first, but what is, what is law in the first place and how should we understand it? And this is a question actually about legal education, I suppose, most directly, but, but the general, more general sort of cultural relationship to um, following law, living with law, making law, uh, deferring to law, teaching law, understanding law, um, and, and what all is contained within law. Because it seems to me, Professor Glendon, one of the ways one could understand that passage from Planned Parenthood v. Casey that you read is a kind of moment of abdication. So it's on the one hand a valorization of the project of sort of moral reflection and development, and on the other, on the other hand, a kind of, I mean, I guess you could say radical privatization of it, at, at the very least, an abdication of the responsibility of the court to have anything to do with it. That's not our business. 
Um, and, and, you know, hearkening back to what Craig Calhoun talked about last night with respect to the, the sort of design principles of republicanism and the ways in which that kind of particular kind of um, corporatist ways of being together have come to just be the furniture of, of late modernity that we don't think about but we think with, you might say. Um, I wonder if, if law with a big L like they teach in the law school across the street is the right way to understand the law. Because, you know, in a sense, what gets opened up by that space of, uh, that's made in Planned Parenthood is room for a lot of other kinds of projects, many of which end up taking the form of technological projects, but that's just one of a larger set of, of fabrics that do normativity in the way Carter was talking about, but don't do law with a big L. So, so why, uh, just a brief comment, and then if you'd like to respond, please do. Um, I think, I think and if you look at the jurisprudence of Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, in fact, what looks like an abdication is in fact a radical imposition on every lower legal authority to, to hew to a particular vision of human identity and personhood. Um, and of course, in, the, in Roe and in, again in Casey, they say, well, the, the unborn are not persons within the meaning of the 14th Amendment. But what I'm talking about is something is deeper than that. Um, what the court in Roe and Casey do is to say, and this actually resonates with the critical legal studies point that like law is everywhere, even where it appears not to be, right? If you try to exercise self-help in a given social encounter and the law intervenes to stop you and to ratify the judgment of the other person, the law is in fact in that space. Okay, so what I mean is, what the court in Casey said is, no legal authority in the state in the United States of America can treat the unborn as if it were a person. No one, and it has to be relegated to the to, to the stand a subpersonal status. Every person, people can choose for themselves whether to treat their own family members as persons or not. But if the law tries to extend the the basic protections of the law to the unborn, we're going to stop them. And we're gonna stop them from doing what they did from before the founding up until 1973, where most jurisdictions had some, and in many cases, ex robust protections uh, for, for, uh, for, for, for unborn human life and unborn human beings. So the, de the declaration of Casey is to say, this, the, in the passage that Marianne read says, this has to be a matter of private judgment. The moral status of this being has to be a matter of private judgment, which means it is forbidden to the legal authorities to treat this being as if it were a legal person. Because if you do that, you're violating the Constitution. And that, to me, is a much more invasive and coercive move by the court than saying, look, everybody just make up your own minds. In fact, if anything, that's what Dobbs does. Dobbs says, look, this is not our business. The Constitution is silent on this question. States can do what they can promote abortion if they want to. They can restrict abortion if they want to. They have legitimate interests in both directions. That's actually what hands off looks like. Um, but what the court and Roe and Casey did was precisely the opposite. They implicitly defined and relegated the unborn to a sub legal, legally speaking, subpersonal status on pain of law. That's good. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. That's to you right there. Uh, thank you, professors. Uh, my name is William Hunter. I'm a student here at Notre Dame. Um, Professor Glendon, I had a broader question about what you believe to be the, either the political or the philosophical underpinnings of the shift in the late 20th century. And I wondered if you could answer it within the context of the early 20th century anti-fascist Catholic philosopher, um, Augusto del Noce, who in the mid 20th century predicted that out of Marxist philosophy, Marxist social philosophy, there would rise a system of moral and um, po morality and politics where the only possible maxim could be don't harm others, and that any attempts to politically impose morality beyond that would be identified with fascism. I'm probably going to disappoint you because I don't think that the revolution of, uh, in all the Western countries, um, the behavioral and attitudinal revolution that took place uh, was philosophically grounded. I think it was the result of combination of factors and uh, one of them would be uh, uh, something that Max Weber said about wars. He said that uh, 
wars by disrupting settled understandings, settled ways of life profoundly. And remember, we had been through two world wars. Weber said that uh, one of the things that happens on the part of citizens and statespersons alike is they make people think that the way things always have been are not the ways things always have to be. And so you have um, many things going on around the world as a result of that uh, kind of, you know, especially in countries that were under colonial rule, this sense, you know, two of the most powerful, one of the most powerful phrases in the UN Charter and the UN Declaration is better standards of life in larger freedom. There was all these pent up longings. So, uh, you, you move along into the 1960s and there are more and more sense of possibilities. Uh, there's the introduction of, uh, of uh, birth control, there is um, uh, uh, changes in the relationship between men and women. Some, some people say that, for example, just divorce for one example. Uh, some people say that no fault divorce law led to more divorce. No, divorce was rising at such a high rate and a rapid rate that lawyers and American law institutes were saying, wow, People are perjuring themselves right and left in these cases, and so we just have to accommodate it because we can't, you know, the whole legal system is being brought into disrepute. Uh, so they, um, the, the change in divorce laws came after the rise in divorce rates. Abortion. Abortion rates were rising to the point where doctors were performing them right and left and calling them therapeutic. And they were very nervous about it and uh, they wanted to escape. I mean, this is Roe versus Wade. I mean, you're the expert, Carter, but Harry Blackman spent that summer at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the doctors wanted to be protected from liability for doing the abortions and calling them therapeutic. They said, one day we're gonna get nailed. So I, my explanation would be sociological rather than, sociological and economic, not philosophical. Then come the rationalizations, <laughs> and as many as you can think of. Thank well, please, please join me in thanking Professor Grunman and Professor Smith. <laughs>